Hi and welcome back to Afternoon Literature. Today I wanted to start a new series that I'm intending to do every month which is called Not Books But Still Stories. So the idea of this series is that I will come and talk to you about some of the things that I have watched or played this month that are still incredibly story heavy but aren't actually within book formats. And this month is one of my favourite ones to bring you. I really think I'm starting this series off with a bit of a bang. This month I got The Last of Us Part 2 after such a long wait. And so I'm really excited to be bringing you a discussion and review of The Last of Us Part 2. Okay, so where do I start? The Last of Us is a video game that is set in a post-apocalyptic world after some kind of infection took down a load of people. Big pandemic, big idea of quarantine zones, um, and a complete overhaul of the world. This happened in 2013, and The Last of Us is set 20 years later. In The Last of Us, we see the relationship between the main character, Joel, and another character, Ellie, develop. Um, through that series, the idea is that Joel is going to be taking Ellie on a journey to get her to the Fireflies because Ellie is actually immune and she is the only person who is immune to the infection. This means that she is potentially the cure and the thing that could save the entirety of humanity. At this point, 20 years on, most of the world is starting to split into factions, but is initially controlled by FEDRA, which is the government who have set up quarantine zones within big major cities, and they're responsible for rationing food, handing this out, controlling infections, and keeping people working, and so on, so that there is still a functioning society. There are small offshoots of this, little groups which have gone on their own, very um, Walking Dead style, and so on, but you only see a very small glimpse of it within the first game. Now, this is all about the second game, so if you haven't played the first and you are interested in that, I can say wholeheartedly it's one of the best games I've ever played. I absolutely loved the story that is presented in The Last of Us Part 1, which is where we see this relationship grow. We see Joel, who is a smuggler and a criminal, um, become someone more worthwhile. We see Ellie, who is a 14-year-old girl, start to see this world in more detail and begin to grow up a little bit. And she feels like she's always lost everything, so she begins to find something that she feels allows her to belong. She also feels like she has a cause and a reason to be alive and we start to see about whether people have hope and humanity and what the beginning of this world is like. If you've not played this game and you want to without spoilers then leave this video now, go and play it, it's brilliant. Also play Left Behind which is a cute little addition that tells you how Ellie discovered she was immune in the first place and shows the relationship between Ellie and her best friend and it's so heartwarming, I just love it. Um, but if you have already played that, then you can stay along here, but please be aware that there are potential spoilers ahead for Last of Us Part 2. Okay, so Last of Us Part 2 now takes place four years after the events of Last of Us Part 1, when Joel and Ellie are still together now and they have come to Jackson, which is a very settled community. Jackson is a community that has now got greenhouses, they started to develop food, they're setting up a kind of society which is safe, they have patrols to look after the infected, and they're starting to develop relationships and family and coming back together in something that we would see as more of a civilised aspect of this world. Jackson is clearly comfortable and comforting. Everyone has homes, families, it's very loving and very giving. They have dancers, they have each have the role to play in society and you start off the game in an incredibly playful way with a snowball fight within the middle of Jackson with some of the kids. It shows the development of that world within the four years and it becomes clear that Joel and Ellie have found a place that is happy, that is welcoming and they have found home. However, this is a very beginning of the game and it's very clearly not what we're going to stick with. So, everyone knew going into The Last of Us 2 that it was going to be a bit brutal. The game itself was always a fun game to play and the developers um, always made fantastic games with some fantastic use of new technology that allowed them to do new and better things with their combat systems. The graphics are visually 
gorgeous and beautiful and the idea of this visual storytelling is completely played through and done exceptionally well. If you're looking for something hyper realistic in its gameplay and also in its style this is 100% the game for you. I really enjoyed the gameplay mechanics of this and I thought it was a really fun thing to play and I really had a good time while I was doing that. The stealth has been upgraded, the combat and melee system is definitely improved, I found the action system not too overwhelming and although I um, really struggle with these games sometimes it wasn't that difficult. Naughty Dog have also done an excellent job of adding some incredible accessibility features because they want to make sure that everyone can play this game if they want. Um, check out the accessibility features if you do struggle with video games, especially stealth style mechanic ones or survival shooter games, then these may be for you because they can massively help and they are really individualised, ranging from different types of audio cues to allow people who are hard of hearing um, to still play and still enjoy this, to um, accessibility ones so that people who are deaf could still play it because, um, not deaf, sorry, you're blind, so if you are um, really, really struggling, if you can't see all these cues, they have a high contrast mode, they have the audio cues in there to allow you to keep playing that, um, they have a lot of different features even if you're just slightly visually impaired and on the subtitle features, but also like if you would struggle, say, holding certain controllers for so long, if you can't, don't have the dexterity to read certain things, that is also included in the accessibility features which are fantastic. In terms of gameplay itself, I think this is like a 10 out of 10 game and I love that. Now we're moving on to story because that's what you're here for because this is still about stories. This story is a revenge plot and going into it everyone knew that the idea was that this wasn't going to be fun. It's gritty and it's gory and it's very gruesome. Um, the world is obviously a brutal one and a world that is cruel. It is very post-apocalyptic and we're at the point now where essentially the governments have been brought down because they just weren't able to control it suitably and so different factions have kind of taken over. I'm going to break this down as I would like a book review, so I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the world building. The world of The Last of Us, despite being an incredibly small place, is incredibly well built. It's a very large scale world, which is odd considering it only takes place within Seattle. You start the job in Jackson, the job, sorry, you start the game within Jackson, but you very quickly move to Seattle and the rest of the game takes place within that one place. Even though you're only within one place, you feel like you're in a much bigger world because you're seeing the Seattle that has been completely overgrown, completely left behind, and that nature has kind of reclaimed. Then you're also seeing the abandoned quarantine zone, so you're able to kind of get an idea of the history within this place that has essentially been through a civil war, where fighting the federal soldiers, it has now been taken over by the WLF, which is the Washington Liberation Front. They are in main control of the aspects of Seattle and they're incredibly high-tech and militarised group. They're more soldier-like, they are um, based on trying to run a new society, on keeping things straight, they want to pull everyone together and keep everyone safe, um, but at the same time they are incredibly brutal and we do see torture in aspects of this. They're very well trained and everyone has their role to play in helping to set up this other society, but they also have commands to kill on sight because they are unwilling to allow their control to be lost. Against these are juxtaposed the Seraphite cult, which is a very back to basics cult. The idea is they don't like technology, they won't use it, they believe that it's part of what corrupted and led to the downfall of society, and so they have gone massively back to the basics and the idea of living on the land. Now they have been allowed the use of the island in the middle of Seattle, which is where their main base and camp is, but they're starting to encroach on WLF territory and this is what is leading to the fights between the Seraphite cults and the WLF. I don't like using the word cult specifically for the Seraphites or the Scars because they will use that word for them. However, the WLF itself has an indoctrination system which is incredibly similar to cult-like systems and so it's hard to say that one's a cult and the other is not. I think the only difference is the indoctrination used within the WLF is done through the idea of a person as a symbol, the idea of rising your way up through the ranks and it's more familiar to us whereas the um, cult-like aspect 
of the Seraphites is done through religion and we tend to call that more cult once we see religious books and prophecies being involved and so on. So the religious teachings is what has led people more to believe in that they're fanatical when actually the WLF are pretty fanatical as well and pretty willing to be brutal. These are a nice juxtaposition against each other. They don't really recognise that actually the two of them are pretty much one and the same. They're just choosing to fight in a different way and technically for a different cause. But really, the Seraphites are also setting up their own societies and both are as oppressive as each other. The Seraphites are a really cool addition to it. Um, they do have murals painted on the walls, they have prophecies and teachings. They've kind of created this whole world and this whole society through it. And they're supposed to have their own language in the use of whistles. They whistle in different ways, and that is brilliant. Okay, so that is world building, which I thought was incredible. Now I'm going to talk about characters and character relationships. We see the original characters of Joel and Ellie in this and we're introduced in more detail to some other characters that featured in Last of Us Part 1. For example, we're introduced to Tommy and we see him more regularly in this, but we're also introduced to new characters. Um, Ellie is her relationship with Dina, who is another young woman from the Jackson um, colony that has been created, is fantastic to see. They start their relationship as four years later so they have been friends for four years so you're coming at it when they are starting their romantic relationship but knowing that they already have a friendship there that they are building upon. We start to see that de the development of those romantic ties between Ellie and Dina and it's really nice to see but it's clearly not a massive part of the story and that is because they've set it up so that Actually, they've already been friends for so long, it kind of makes sense now that they choose to be romantic with each other, that they will be willing so quickly to kind of go along with each other and never want to be apart and so on. It stops the insta-lovey aspect of it because they're not, it's not a new addition. Dina is always someone Ellie has known and always someone Ellie has been close to, but it does allow for that new relationship to be there and to flourish, and I think that is brilliant. We also see the relationship between other characters in the um game. I'm gonna say I was gonna say novel, but it's not within the game, and that is like the relationship between Owen and Abby and then this love triangle well triangle, this love aspect that you then get with Mel as well. So Owen and Abby had a previous relationship, they've grown up together, they clearly love each other so well. But whether it worked out romantically is another matter and they at this point are split up and Owen is dating Mel. Mel has become pregnant by Owen and so they are going to be starting a family and be together. But then we see that actually Owen pretty much is still in love with um, Abby. But he also doesn't feel like he can stay in this world anymore. Now the character of Owen is a character that I really loved and really came to... Um, I'm really came to understand... <laughs> And like through this game and that is because he seems to be an almost a voice of reason he is very much um understands that the wlf is actually indoctrinating them that this isn't the best way to live that they need as a place to land and they have found that but actually it's just going too far and it's just constant fighting and it doesn't seem to be serving any purpose other than to lead to the point where they're all dying and he just wants to start building the society back up and stop destroying and, just, and taking down communities and societies in the meantime. On the other hand, Owen's also having an incredibly tough time with this because everyone around him and everyone he loves is so ingrained within this community. He starts to see the other side of it and see what could be and relate to other people and he's just not willing to do it anymore. He recognises the humanity in everyone and at this point now he just wants to move on to a place where he feels like we can all be who we want to be. He's incredibly optimistic and hopeful and I really enjoyed his character. Um, that counterpoints with the character of Abby. Now in this you have the character of Abby and Ellie and both are seeking revenge. They're constantly seeking vengeance and revenge within this game and that is what leads to such a dark and dismal plot. This is ultimately a revenge story and so that will bring me now on to plot. Vengeance is constant in this and no one lets it 
up. Although there are clear points when they could stop, when each of them can say it's enough, we always see it pushed that little bit further. The story becomes repetitive in the end because you're seeing one person want vengeance and then the next person and then they've got to get vengeance for that vengeance and then they've got to get revenge for this and it's just never enough and why does it end where will it stop? And that's kind of disappointing. Now for me preferably I don't like revenge plots and I don't like revenge stories. It could be one aspect of a storyline and that's fine but for it to be the entire thing I just I think it's a little bit pointless um I understand that this word is dark destructive and dismal however I don't think there's a problem with some levity and a bit of hope to help elevate some of these aspects I also think you can't really understand how dismal something is if we don't have that levity to raise it up we don't understand what happiness is if we don't have sadness otherwise we would all live content and if we all lived content then it gets pretty boring so in order to experience the low points as much as they wanted us to experience these low points we really do need to experience these high points and i just don't think that the plot and pacing allowed for that um i feel like and i think it's been mentioned in interviews and comments that the developers just wanted an onslaught of constant grimness they wanted you to feel beaten down by this game they wanted you to feel the overwhelming anxiety and frustrations and um, how lost and destroyed the characters come to feel in it. And I completely understand that, but there's also a way to do it. We can't really feel that complete loss and that complete degradation and that idea of destruction if we are never genuinely given a point of comparison. We see a very, very small glimpse of the wonderful life that Ellie has created but that's taken away within the first hour and you never get anything else to juxtapose it against um and i just think that that was poorly done we then see in the second half we essentially get a repeat of the first half and so by that bit you're kind of bored of this revenge idea this revenge story you know where it's going and it becomes incredibly predictable unfortunately that was not the plot for me and when I got to the epilogue and we saw a glimpse of hope, it's instantly taken away and we continue with this idea of revenge. And completely, ultimately, I just think it was the wrong way to end the game. Some other good things that I wanted to mention that do happen in the story, which I think elevate this and bring this to a really great like, conclude, um, aspect of the game. We have the opportunity to really get to know and understand some people and understand some of this world. I think the way that you explore the Seraphites through the character of Yara and Lev was a really good way to try and understand that and make that clear. Clearly, the character of Abby is really opposed to the Seraphites. She's a WLF. She thinks that they are a cult. She thinks that they are fanatical and misguided and that everything they say should be dismissed. However, Yara and Lev actually bring up some very good points in this and they start to give her a completely different idea of some of the people. They're not saying that everything that happens within this cult is good and their storyline very clearly makes it clear that they are outsiders to this cult or at least now they are outsiders to this cult and that acceptance is not the key here. However, they just want her to recognise that maybe the way she's doing everything isn't right either and that there are counterpoints and ways you could look around that. Lev is a complete symbol of hope in this. He is a character that has been ostracised and outed from his community and um, because he just doesn't feel comfortable, he doesn't feel comfortable within his own skin and here he is and within the community. Um, Le Lev identifies as he um, but was born female, the community constantly misgenders Lev um, and when Lev decides to cut his hair that's seen as sacrilege and he's completely outcasted from that society. It's not something you want to see. So seeing the acceptance in other characters for this element is fantastic but at the same time it feels like like they just needed to make a little bit more of that cult so you would really understand where this was coming from and then it wasn't just like oh look they hate people who are trans or have a different gender or so on um i don't think that's really what they're going for and i think the character of love is fantastic but i think the character of love is fantastic regardless of this aspect of them he very much consistently 
makes the hopeful plea and the plea for humanity and I think that is brilliant. We only see redemption in these characters at the end because Lev is a massive part of that. It's the idea that the new generation, despite these hardships, despite completely being brought up in this world, actually still has hope and humanity and the ability to come together and I really liked that little touch that is added. Um, I also thought that this was really interesting that what we see is a entirely kind of female-led game. Now in this we see a game that is led by a, a character who identifies as lesbian. We also see this led by a cis white character or who is presented in a very masculine way. The representation in this game is much better. I think it doesn't need to kind of be mentioned that Ellie's lesbian because that's kind of obvious from the first couple of games. It was just that's how she reads, that's how she is and then left behind and thrown to her and then in this game we're just seeing the aftermath and result of it and the fact that it's very much just a part of her is a fantastic addition to it. Um, we do see some instances of bigotry where it's tackled and fought against but the overwhelming acceptance of it and the idea that it's just a norm and not something that needs commenting on I think is a really nice touch by an artist of here but what I find particularly interesting about this is actually the fact that we see the two main characters in this idea of vengeance and revenge they don't get the opportunity to be redeemed and it's one of the best games here. So here we are seeing two main female characters and these two main female characters are kind of like not given the opportunity to be redeemed or be happy in the end and that's kind of sad to use two female characters who can represent some idea of change or be representatives of other people in the community that don't usually get to see that and not give them the opportunity to be happy at all. That's disappointing I think and I wish it had ended a different way. Okay so overall what does I think of the story? Well I think in um, Last of Us 2 you have a fantastic world, you have an incredible set of characters and relationships and that was done extremely well. I just think that the world was underutilised and there was a different way we could have explored that. I think that the plot itself is kind of repetitive and predictable and I just think that we needed some counterpoints to it to kind of enhance, enhance and heighten those elements that they really wanted us to so that we would really feel that emotional shock um, but also get those moments of low pacing that you needed in order to really resonate on the high points in this where they wanted you to feel that incredible emotional pull. Um, Overall, I did enjoy playing this game. The gameplay is fantastic. I really loved that. I loved returning to characters that I knew and I loved meeting new characters. And I do think it was a really good game. But if I was giving this a rating as a book, then it would definitely be a freestyle book for me rather than a five star one. And that is because the story itself, while I had some incredibly good aspects, just underperformed and was underdeveloped. The pacing um, is kind of broken up with flashbacks and things like that, but in the end they become confusing and overused, and I just don't think it was enough to save every part of this story. Did I enjoy this game? Yes. Would I recommend it to others? Most definitely. If you enjoyed Last of Us 1, please play Last of Us Part 2. It was fantastic. And if you have not played either, then, then get them. They're great. But, in my personal opinion, is Last of Us 2 better than Last of Us 1? No. I prefer the story, I prefer the relationships in Last of Us 1, and I think it was done a little bit better. There are some fantastic elements that you've added, but there could have been more. Okay, so that is me this month doing my not books but still stories monthly. I'm going to come back next month with another one where I will talk either about books, um, either about TV shows, movies or other games that I've played over the month. Please comment below if you've played Last of Us and you want to talk to me about any of these elements because I would love it even though I know it's a new game and not many people have played it yet but you know let me know. If you like this video please give it a like and if you want to see more from my channel then please subscribe. I hope you all have a great week. See you soon.